Your Royal Highness, what was it like seeing the floods for yourself today? Do we really have to face catastrophes and chaos before real action needs to be taken? In the run-up to COP21, the UN's latest climate conference due to be held in Paris, Prince Charles agreed to talk exclusively to Sky News. It's been a busy morning for you. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Your Royal Highness, thank you so much for, for taking time to talk to us. Um, over the years, you have been so passionate about this issue of climate change. You have been to many climate change conferences, lots of meetings, people getting round tables. We're heading towards COP21. What are you hoping will come out of Paris? What are you hoping will be the, the priority? There's been so many of these conferences that have happened over the years, and I think I go back quite a long way on, on all this. I haven't been to all of them, but I went to Copenhagen um, in 2009, and that really ended in disaster, frankly, which is a total tragedy because we've lost all those years in between, so there's a lot to catch up on. So the trouble is it's not going to be... I don't think the conference is going to be an end in itself because it's after that, after the conference, because it's going to be very difficult, I think, to get agreement on the necessary reductions and the necessary... Uh, actions that need to be taken to keep global warming, you know, at two degrees or <laughs> ideally below. Um, so we then have to follow up. This is the key, and ratchet up the the commitments after mm -hmm. the the Paris conference. There's no doubt that there will be um, a huge amount of discussion about the economics surrounding it. Uh, we're constantly being told at the moment that we're in a time of austerity, whether it's individuals, whether it's governments or businesses. Yeah. Can we really afford to commit the time and, and the money to, to dealing with these issues? Well, the trouble is if we don't, this is the awful thing, if we don't, it's going to get so much worse that it then life will become very, very complicated indeed. And what we're experiencing now will be, I mean, as nothing to the, to the problems. I mean, the, the, the difficulties in 2008 with the, you know, the financial crash, uh, that was a banking crisis. But we're now facing the real possibility of nature's bank going bust. But we've somehow developed our entire approach, economical approach, without including nature. Everything's been designed to push nature or squash it or over-exploit it. Do you see what I mean? And, and we have to now find a way to, to reintegrate all these natural systems back into our, our, our own economy. Because the difficulty, I always think, is we are part of nature ourselves, but we've excluded that from our whole outlook on life. So in that sense, it's absolutely crucial, however difficult things are now. The great thing, I think, is to see the opportunities in all this, because people somehow think that uh, it's an either or. It's either dealing with the environment and climate change and everything else, or economic growth and, and uh, so on. But it's not, because Sweden is one of the countries that's proved this over the last 25 years, it succeeded, for instance, in reducing its emissions by 23%, at the same time as growing its economy by 55%. So that's what's called decoupling. So they don't need to be diametrically opposed? No, no because there's the immense opportunities in you know, the low-carbon economy, as it's described. And there's an enormous amount of work going on and hugely encouraging developments in... Uh, all these new technologies, which, you know, are much, much more efficient and effective. And we've only just begun, I think, now to see uh, what is possible in terms of second generation renewables, for instance. We have to realize that we have to switch, but faster than we think, because <laughs> the trouble with all this and climate change is that what has happened over all these years since the Industrial Revolution but certainly in this, well, in the 20th century and now, uh, all that contribution 
to global warming and climate change from the emissions we put out, uh, mm. they don't disappear. I mean, <laughs> they don't suddenly disappear through holes in the atmosphere. The trouble is they're all trapped there. Mm. But all that is still gradually having an effect. So that's why it's even more important to tackle this issue as urgently as possible. Otherwise, the increase in temperature will be so much more. The urgency, I think, is even greater to try and do something about those challenges. So I would ask how these people are going to face their grandchildren. For decades, he's placed himself at the center of the climate change debate. Prime Minister Stoltenberg, uh, President... Some have mocked Prime his Minister thoughts on the Trump. environment. <laughs> Others have celebrated his forward-thinking approach. Again at COP21, he's been invited to deliver one of the keynote speeches, just as he did in Copenhagen in 2009. You're obviously so passionate about us tackling this issue now, but some people will say that there are wider global issues. So many of us have seen the pictures of the tens of thousands of, of refugees heading from the likes of Syria uh, to Europe. Is our money and our time not better spent on issues like that? Well, we're seeing a classic case of not dealing with the problem because, I mean, some, it sounds awful to say, but some of us were saying 20-something years ago that if we didn't tackle these issues, you would see ever greater conflict over scarce resources and uh, ever greater difficulties over drought and the, the accumulating effect of climate change, which means that people have to move. And in fact, there's very good evidence indeed that, that one of the major reasons for this horror in Syria, funnily enough, has been a, was a drought that lasted for about five or six years, which meant that huge numbers of people in the end had to leave the land because the water ran out, their crops failed and so on. And increasingly they came into the cities, already full of, Iraqi refugees from that horror and that crisis and this combined to create a, a, a very difficult situation. And it's bad enough now with refugees, we think what's going to be like if we don't deal with the problem which is actually helping to cause it because the conflict very often comes from movement of people as a result of not being able to survive. So are you suggesting that there is, there is a, a link between climate change and, and conflict? Absolutely. And terrorism? Yes. And, yeah. Well, I mean, it's only in the last few years the Pentagon have actually started to pay attention to this because it's, I mean, it, is, it has a huge impact on, on, on what is happening. And, I mean, the difficulty is, is sometimes to, to get this point across that if we just leave it and say, well, <laughs> there are obviously lots of, because endless problems will arise all over the place, therefore we deal with them in a short-term way. Mm -hmm. We never deal with the underlying root cause, which regrettably is what we're doing to our natural environment. And whether we like it or not, we depend on that environment. Every year you hear how temperatures are increasing or you know, there's more rainfall than's ever been before in one day. I mean, this, this is a trend, regrettably, and we need, to, we need to grasp this with a sense of real urgency. How do we get developing countries on board with the developed countries because can we say to, to developing countries you need to be committing as much to this as everybody else when actually they're still trying to build their economies they need to build factories they're potentially going into forests taking them down can, can we all be doing the same together yes is it possible yes i mean there, there are some marvelous examples of where this is already happening and there are some very you know, enlightened and far-sighted um, leaders of these countries who you know, have seen exactly what the problem is and have already worked on this particular challenge and have got some, well, for instance, there are some very good examples of, of where the private sector has sat down together with, the, uh, with local people mm -hmm. and, uh, and the government in different countries big corporations to have a much better and more integrated approach to all these issues. I mean, so there are marvellous uh, 
instances of where a more enlightened, integrated approach, which is a public-private and NGO partnership approach, can actually work a remarkable degree of positive change. So half the battle, I think, is how you scale up these examples of best practice. More than 190 countries will gather for the conference in Paris, aiming to reach a new global agreement on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Campaigners like Prince Charles believe this is crunch time for a new consensus. We will obviously in the, in the coming weeks be talking a great deal about green issues, climate change, but there almost seems to be a disconnect with the public at the moment. The public don't necessarily seem to be tuned in to the message. Why do you think that is? But I wonder if that's really the case. I mean, I, I think the trouble is a lot of people feel powerless. I think they feel, what could I do you know, as an individual? And uh, I mean, there are some, I think, again, remarkable examples all around the country of people wanting to do all sorts of things. And uh, there are the, the difficulty is what can can I or what can others do as an individual, but but frequently it it, it needs the framework set in order to to allow the changes and the necessary uh, movement to be made. Do we need to incentivise them more? You've you've been talking about this issue for, for four decades now. There must have been times when you've been incredibly frustrated about what you might perceive as, as a slow rate of change or uptake yeah. among individuals. Well, it is a funny thing about life. <laughs> as you get older, you realise sometimes that these things take longer than you think. And actually, I, here am I, you know, at my age, um, it's just a blink of an eye in terms of the overall age of this planet. And you just have to understand in the end, I think, that it all takes much longer and that so often it's the whole of your lifetime, I've come to the conclusion, before perhaps awareness reaches the point where finally more action is taken. But I, I do think that incentives and disincentives are needed and again there are marvelous examples of some countries which have taken the steps to to introduce the incentives and they can work enormously many green campaigners in the uk have criticized cuts in subsidies for renewable energy sources like solar panels and want tougher penalties to stop pollution you won't see the prince pointing the finger of blame at specific individuals, governments or businesses. As a future king, he must aim to stay above the politics. But that doesn't stop his efforts to spread the climate change message, including educating his own grandson. Fortunately, he's one of those characters, I think, who, who naturally, instinctively likes to be outside. It's very interesting. I was Intrigued to see if it lasts, but he, he loves being outside, and, which is encouraging. Really. As a member of the royal family, travel has been a regular part of the prince's life. In his late teens, he started to take a real interest in the environment. Trips overseas giving him an extraordinary view of the world and an insight into how our planet was changing. experiences spurring on his desire to stop nature from being destroyed. Do you remember the moment when the light bulb went on in your mind 40 years ago and you thought, actually, we need to change our relationship with the planet? Was it a certain visit? Was it no. somewhere that you went to? No, what was it? it? Wasn't. I, well, I think I've said this before, but 
probably very boring, but you know, when I was a teenager in the 60s, I saw so much being destroyed around around us. Um, and I, you know, I saw the, you know, the digging up of, you know, our, all our precious, you know, flourish meadows and wetlands, and the hedges were ripped up and the trees cut down, and the centres of our towns and cities were ripped out, and you know, it was all going on at, at a huge pace. And I remember thinking, but this is going to go too far. And the more I thought about it, I mean, I was one of those boring people who thought about these things, the more I felt that you, you needed a balance in all these things. Otherwise, if you go too far in one direction, inevitably, if you look at life in 25, 30 years, if it goes too far, there's, an, there's a sort of equal and opposite reaction. It goes the other way. And these enormous oscillations can be so um, exhausting and dangerous and, anyway, expensive. You spend all that money. You then have to spend a hell of a lot to put it right again. So why not look at it in a, in a more integrated and, and balanced way and work out which are the timeless things that matter and which are the things that actually you can throw away or change. But if you look at the timeless things, then there's an awful lot that does matter. I mean, for instance, um, you know, just talking about developing countries, there's a, still a lot of indigenous people living in association with forest systems or wetlands who have an equal right to, to go on in association with their, you know, their particular environment. So, you know, all these things come together at the same time. We have to decide whether... You know, we're prepared to to make this place last. It's the only one we've got at the moment. Daniel Craig, actor, optimist. In his own way, the Prince of Wales has become a climate change celebrity, able to get people talking and attracting star support for campaigns, including his push to protect the rainforests. William, Harry. Trying to preserve the rainforests. His own family also helping to get his message across. For all of us, we must act now. Future generations are depending on us. Charles, Prince of Wales. In a lot of your speeches, you refer to the legacy that we're leaving behind for our children, our grandchildren. Um, <laughs> for you, how? How easy is it to convey these quite complicated concepts to young people? Can you see yourself sitting down with your grandchildren and trying to educate them? I think at Highgrove you're already trying to get Prince George out into the garden and into nature. Well, yeah, but he, fortunately, he's one of those characters, I think, who, who naturally, instinctively likes to be outside. It's very interesting. I was Intrigued to see if it lasts, but he, he loves being outside, and, which is encouraging. But, no, I mean, like all these things, it depends if, they, if you can get them to take an interest. But it, half of it comes from you know, explaining you know, the minutiae of life sometimes, or getting people to look carefully at something, even watching an insect or a bird, or you know, observing carefully a flower, or you know, how a building sits in the environment and the landscape. And all these things are part of the sort of intricate detail and pattern, you know, of life, which we can't exist without. It's harnessing that enthusiasm yes. and making sure that it is relevant to, to the public and, yes. and to children. Yeah. So if you boil it down, for instance, to bees, let us say, if you talk to a lot, a lot of people understand, I think, that bees are important. They produce honey. But, but if, we, if we lose the bees, which are in danger of doing so, partly through the way we farm, industrial farming systems and intensive systems and using chemical sprays and all this stuff, if we lose the bees and the pollinators, the, they are absolutely vital for our food. So I I if you concentrate on, for instance, one species or you know, a particular fish, or seabird or something. That is a way, I think, of, of focusing the problem. And 
then people begin to realize that all these things are interconnected. Our conventional approach has created all these separate, compartmentalized ways of looking at the world. Tote everything is zoned, so nothing is seen as a whole. If you don't see it as a whole, then you end up with all these horrors, and each one you have to deal with is a short-term problem. Yep. So each time, as you were saying, oh, you had to deal with that. And mm. But the whole thing needs to be seen as an inter... That's why I've been trying to say for so long that we need to tackle all these issues as a partnership between the private sector, the public sector, and the NGOs and civil society. In 2010, he wrote the book Harmony, described as a new way of looking at the world, encouraging the reader to adopt a more sustainable lifestyle. At Ashley School in Walton-on-Thames, it's up to the children to monitor how much energy and water the school is using and the waste that they're producing. We got the whole school and if it's under the whole school target, we get five minutes extra break. Yeah. Why is it important for you both to save energy? Because of like climate change and you know, we want to stop polluting our world. The pupils are taught to follow the Prince's Harmony Principles after the head teacher read his book. We've got our solar panels up there um, and we've got um, our water um, harvesting over there. Mm -hmm. And over there we've got recycling bin. Lessons also focus on the geometry of nature and how we should be at one with our planet. For some reason or other, he read that book I produced with two other people about five years ago. He wrote to me about it, and um, he's one of those extraordinary people who's so energetic and uh, has grasped these issues that he wanted to, to put them into practice in his school. He's got lots of other schools involved. He's running all these workshops. And my, uh, another of my organizations has helped produce teaching material, but basically what he what he's doing is what I was suggesting, which is to recognize the universal principles. So the, what he's doing is the children are being introduced to the basic geometry on which everything, everything uh, is based. So how flowers unfold according to a geometric pattern, how we, we develop, we grow again according. But, but it's fascinating what you, children really respond to, to starting with the circle and the, you know, the square and the triangle they can and leading see on patterns. from there. And then suddenly they're introduced to how this relates to the rest of the universe and the world around us. So you then start building a picture of how we are part of all this and how we can integrate with it but also develop an approach and an economic system that puts nature back at the centre of the process. So we recognise there's such a thing called natural capital, mm -hmm. nature's capital, from which we have to draw an income, not exploiting the capital to the bottom. And they can take that message back to their parents. Well, the hope, yes, because suddenly yeah. the whole integrated approach comes, comes, comes alive to them. It's a new way, as I said in the book, of looking at our world, <laughs> or a rediscovered way of looking at it. It's such a multifaceted uh, subject. Just one final question. <laughs> Are you feeling optimistic about the future? There'll be so much discussion about those, yes. that two degrees temperature rise. Mm. Can we get a consensus? No. It's always difficult because there's a lot of argy-bargy that goes on with these yeah. things, you can imagine. And inevitably people want somebody else to pay for it. Mm. Uh, you know, I, obviously I try to be as optimistic as possible, but sometimes you think that do we really have to face catastrophes and chaos before we understand that real action needs to be taken? And the difficulty with all that is that by the time you try to take the action, it's already too late. The climate scientists and others say that we're already on a path to a four degree rise. So we have to work very hard to get it back to two. I mean, we're already seeing the Arctic melting. Bits of Antarctica are now you know, dropping off and melting. You've got droughts and drying up forests in Brazil and elsewhere. And part of the problem of all the droughts now around Sao Paulo in Brazil is because of deforestation. You've got fires going on in 
in the huge areas of, of Indonesia and some in Colombia. So, of course, there are lots of optimistic, encouraging signs of all the right things being done. Mm. But the key, if I may say so, is if we don't get exactly what is wanted at COP21 in Paris, that the follow-on is even more energetic and we bring in even more, which I try to do, the private sector and, and others to, to, to produce the necessary steps that we, we must have. Thank you very much. It is a huge topic. There will be much to discuss as the weeks go on. But it's been a pleasure to talk to you. So thank you very much. Thank you. The Prince appreciates not everyone will be watching every twist and turn of the UN's climate conference. But he will continue to try and get the wider world on side, building the momentum that's needed to protect the planet.